I know that you are, you did an event, a yeah, great yeah. event with Cornell West. Yeah. So Cornell West is running, Jill Stein is running. How do you see them fitting into this? I mean, we have done a lot as a party. We've done a lot of work with both Jill Stein and Cornell West. There's a lot of respect. Um, they are part of the larger movement in the left. And so, you know, we, we are very grateful for any moment that we have to collaborate. What, what I think the difference is, yeah. which I think is what you're getting at, is that we are running explicitly as socialists and that we are running a campaign that is to build a political organization that does work again every day. We're not um, running independently. We're running as the Party for Party Socialism, Party, yeah. part of uh, the Party for Socialism and Liberation. And we have developed an instrument for working class people to come in and get activated and organizing in their communities. That is what we're here to offer people. People who don't engage in voting, you know, have a place in our, in our infrastructure. People who engage in voting have the option to vote for something that aligns with their politics, with their values and their ideology. And so it's a, it's a, it's a different way of thinking about politics, again, that goes beyond the four-year electoral process. It's not about putting your faith in someone it's about putting your faith in building political organization of our working class that is independent of the ruling class. And that is very explicitly socialist and wants to build a socialist society that we do so desperately need in this country. And another thing that you're, um, so you guys are, you guys are like frenemies, you and Cornell and Jill. Oh, no, so what, what could we call it? I wouldn't call it frenemies. Comrades. Comrades, but running with different, different yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you know. I just get, want to use the word. <laughs> I know we're not proud of you. Um, you know, I think we're aligned in a lot of things. Like for example, and we are aligned in the anti-war yeah. movement. Like Jill Stein has been really good in understanding the politics behind Ukraine, Russia. Yeah. Understanding that NATO is actually a war between NATO and Russia. Yeah. And it's a war of the United States that- Ukraine, the Ukraine yeah, war. Yeah, Ukraine is a proxy, you know, right. it's a pro proxy war. And so I think she's been really vocal about it, very clear about it politically, you know, in terms of Cornell, same thing. Um, I think that there's differences. Like we are here for the total liberation of Palestine. Ceasefire is the urgent call. Right, but just the beginning. Just the beginning. But if Palestine, is not totally free, then we risk having the continuation of threats against babies, against innocent people, against civilians. We still have an occupation. Right. We still have Israel determining whether people eat, whether they have electricity, who goes in and who comes out. We still have young women being practically, you know, harassed sexually because in prison, in, in prison but also like going from one checkpoint to yeah. the next. You know, daily be, humiliation. Yeah, daily humiliation. Yeah. And so we want the total liberation of Palestine. And we say that with our whole chest. And we fight and been in the struggle for as long as the party has been there, many of us before then. Mm -hmm. You know, and so I think um, there is a there's a significant difference. And Stein and West don't have that same I mean, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily say that they do or don't. Okay. Um, but it's not as much as part I there. Think, yeah, I think it's not as much. I think that they are, you know. Cornell, when he initially came out, was talking about two sides of the story, was talking about, you know, uh, both, you know, communities. And the the reality is that there is no two sides of the story. I, there, is, occupation. there is an occupation. Is those who are occupying and those who are resisting occupation. Mm -hmm. That's the story. You know, th those that are being ex explo exploited and oppressed and those who are fighting to liberate themselves. That's the story, you know, to take up. Um, and I even heard it's like very similar to the line of AOC when she says, you know, like release the hostages. My son, who's nine years old, understands that if you take up in war, you take prisoners is because you need to trade them for other prisoners. And one prisoner is the equivalent of a thousand prisoners. In Pal that Palestinians have in Israeli prisons, you know? Right, right now there's 10,000, and they're talking about 200 hostages while Palestinians have 10,000 in Israeli prisons being tortured. So it's also interesting because, I mean, what I can't wait for, I'm sure it's gonna come out, but 
Israel, we know Israel has nothing but disdain for Palestinians. Of course. But what's interesting is that they don't even care about protecting the, the hostages. No. They're bombing the they're buildings. They're bombing everything. Yeah. And that is what I'm like, guys, you had one job. I mean, I know they're full of it, but, you know, this whole, they they, they want to, their priority is cleansing Gaza of they, Palestinians, and they're not going to let these Israeli hostages get in the way of that. I mean, they're saying, they're, unro they're, they're unrolling the Nakba, Nakba 2023, yeah. which is bullshit because they have they been, never stopped. They've never stopped. Right. This has been ongoing. And the Nakba, uh, for people who don't know, that means uh, catastrophe or disaster translate in different ways, but it's Arabic for catastrophe, disaster, and it's a reference to 1948, the ethnic cleansing yeah. of Palestinians. 700,000 Palestinians were displaced. And since then, many thousands more, you know? And now you have millions of people who are being displaced. That is what yeah. forcefully, violently displaced. Those who are not being killed right. are being driven out of their land. And so what to say... Two sides of the story? No, no, no. There's no two sides of the story. The United States of America finances these people right. militarily and financially. It's not the same when it comes to the resistance of Palestine. And so that was a huge kind of like, oh, yeah. we're not, um, I don't know how I feel about that. It's one thing to say, you know, because it is true, we're anti-Zionist. We're not anti-Semitic. Right, of course. Because there are people who are Christian, who are Jews, who are there. Right in that territory, and who before 1948 lived together. Right, coexisted. Yeah, yeah, without the intervention of the United States and the creation of Israel as a colonial project. Right. And so we're not anti-Semitic, but we are anti-genocide. We are anti, you know, the oppression and exploitation of the majority of people in that land. Well, how could it be anti-Semitic when you have Jews like Jewish Voice for Peace, if not now, J. Fred, all a these lot, Jews yeah. are getting arrested yeah, because exactly. they also are against genocide. Yeah. I mean, that's the, that's what's so scary about this is Israel pretending to speak in the name of Jews. One of the silver linings of this is that I think it's getting harder and harder to pretend that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism when you see so many Jews that's right. at the forefront of these protests, right. some of them, not that's all right. of them, of course. Right. Um, but just to, I think that there was a, for, for some of these folks, there was a hesitancy on October 8th. Yeah. Right, right after, right? To be able to take a bold position and say, no, wait a minute. The resistance is actually justified because we're talking about occupied people. There was a, there was a hesitancy because they did, you know, they wanted to do the, they didn't want to answer the question, do you condemn Hamas? Right. And I think for us, as a political party, as a PSL, we had really clear line. We support the total liberation of Palestine, and we understand that resistance is justified when occupation is there. And what is happening is actually people breaking free from a open-air prison, from a, a, a concentration camp. That's what's happening. Yeah. And so, for but for other folks, it was kind of the hesitancy of like, wait a minute, politically, how do we? And it's not that complicated if you are, if you have integrity. Mm -mm. You know? Yeah. I mean, I think there are people who think that killing soldiers and kidnapping soldiers is different from killing civilians and kidnapping civilians. But I don't think that means that you change your position on the occupation. Of course. You can. Um, and what about, tell us, another part, uh, part of your program, just looking at it right now, is cut the military budget by 90 percent, peace, not war with China and Russia. So tell, tell us about your position on those two countries. I mean, f for one... Um, we are anti-imperialist. And so anything that is supportive of the imperialist project, we're not going to support. And we understand that geopolitically, China is growing, is growing economically and is growing as a force in, in geopolitics and, and geostrategy. And the United States has never been one to kind of allow for multipolarity to be a thing. Um, in fact, it has done the complete opposite. And so more than anything, our desire is to be able to avoid any type of imperialist war against China or Russia. We do believe that the unipolarity that the United States has created has been a deadly one, and it has been one that has been on the basis of war, of occupation and invasion. I mean, we have a U.S. military budget that is over a trillion dollars. Again, trillion dollars that could be utilized for other things that we need to be able to sustain the life of people in this country. We have over a thousand military bases all across the world. We have projects like NATO, AFRICOM, the Southern Command. These are all there precisely to maintain the hegemony of the United States militarily, economically, and politically. 
all over the world. And so who gave the United States the authority to be the police of the world? Um, there is no moral, like the United States has no moral authority when it's actually being criminal against its own people. It, sh it should not be, right. you know? And so when we are saying that we are proposing the cut of 90% of the military budget is because the military doesn't need that budget. They really don't, unless the plan and the intention is to have control of, 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 of over the world, yeah. which is basically what the intention has been. And so our position, again, more than anything, is that if we want to build, because everything is about national security, to build national security, we need to be able to build justice within this country. We need to be able to build a society where people feel safe in this country. And safety comes by supplying the needs mm -hmm. of people, right. not by gauging, engaging in war with other countries. Which could lead to World War III. Of course. Yeah. But they don't care. I know, that's what's so scary. They don't care. A very exciting announcement of a very special live show that I'll be doing with journalist Ron Kalik, journalist Abby Martin, and PSL presidential candidate Claudia de la Cruz. We will be doing this live show on January 16th at 7 p.m. at the People's Forum, which is at 320 West 37th Street. And you can get your tickets at peoplesforum.org. Again, that's peoplesforum.org. The show is January 16th at 7 p.m. at the People's Forum at 320 West 37th Street. And the special guests will be Rania Kalik, Abby Martin, and Claudia de la Cruz. If you can't make it, we will be streaming it live at the Katie Helper Show. 